Shion, we are so glad to have you here. Uh, Africa Oye is the biggest African and uh, Caribbean live music festival we have now in Europe. We have declared that today, yeah. actually, and we are glad you are here with us, you know, as a, an Afrobeat person. So, Shion, tell me, what do you think of Africa Oye? Well, I think you're right in terms of, you know, but I think what you got wrong is that he also has the biggest energy. I've never seen so many people partying under the rain before. You know, in Nigeria, one drop of water, everybody runs home. Ah! <laughs> you know, yeah, so it was great today to see this huge party in the rain. And, you know, everybody was prepared. Umbrellas, <laughs> raincoats. Uh, at Glastonbury last year, I expected, I expected it to rain. So if you saw my video on BBC, I performed in wellies. I had wellies on. Not a drop of rain. Today, I'm in Liverpool. I'm like, okay, it's going to be sunny. I have nice shoes on. Rain everywhere. You know, just goes to show my luck. You know, but no, it was a great festival today. It was my first time. We've had a few close calls with Africa Oye that didn't work out. But I'm glad we came through this year. This was the time. Yeah, you see, the beauty of Africa Oye is that um, they, 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 they did it inclusive. It's... Uh, there's inclusion, there's diversity, there is uh, recognition they catered for disabled people and people that are deaf. That's one thing I love about Africa OE. And also the multicultural at point, tone at of it. At some point, we have to stop giving ourselves credit for doing the human thing. You know, I know the world is fucked, pardon my French, the world is twisted right now. Yes. You know, so when we do what we are supposed to do, everybody wants a pat in the back. You know. We, I'm glad that we embrace our true human spirit, which is the African spirit, you know, the spirit of inclusion, as you say, you know. Uh, being one with nature, you know, not only including humanity in our thoughts, but also understand that humanity is a part of something even bigger, which is nature, you know. So that for me, I love seeing that. And it just shows that we humans are learning to be what we are supposed to be again after all these years of torment under capitalism. I know your father has a great influence on your, on your music and your music career. Could you give us a little bit of information about your dad and how you started with your dad and started going into Egypt AT and when you were here in Liverpool and stuff like that? I want to, uh, my story in music has a lot to do with nepotism. You know, I cannot lie. There was a lot of nepotism <laughs> in my rise in the Egypt 80 band in the beginning, you know, because I started playing with my dad when I was eight, you know. And to be eight and to get into the Egypt 80 is just because your dad owns the band, you know. So I accept the nepotism. Because, <laughs> like you know, when I was eight, I, I watched my dad play a show in Apollo. And funny enough, I headlined Apollo as well, a solo concert in April. Awesome. You know, it was a... Uh, complete 360 moment for me because that was where I watched my dad and said, you know, hmm, this is what I want to do when I grow up. This has to be the easiest job in the world, you know? So I told my dad, I was like, fella, I want to start singing. So he said, hmm, when you get to Lagos, start practicing with the band. You know, that was my story into Egypt 80. So I started off opening the shows for my dad since I was eight, you know. Then it became a job. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, because every Friday night we had to go to the shrine to perform, you know, so I had to go to bed early, you know, my friends were up late because it's Friday and every Friday night when I had to sleep early, everybody had something interesting to say on Saturday morning. Oh, we did this, we don't have bikes. I'll be like, oh my God, you know, so I missed a lot of Friday night shenanigans with my friends, but I also I wouldn't say I'm like a lot of child artists that are like, oh, I miss my childhood. No, it was a good balance. You know, uh, I had a lot of fun growing up, playing with the band, learning. Then I came to Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool was the first time I was able to play with musicians my age because I'd always been playing in the Egypt 80. You know, and Liverpool gave me all the confidence I needed as an artist because it was the first time I actually met my peers at Lipa, played music with them, and I was like, I'm not half bad. You know, hey, because playing with all these veterans, I used to think I was shit. Pardon my French. French. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Go on, go on. I didn't think I was really that good. I didn't really think I was that good, you know, growing up, playing with all these guys. But when I came to Lipa, you know, and I was playing with people that were my age, teenagers, you know, early, 
I turned 21 in Lipa as well, which derailed my education. Like a mo it derailed my education a bit for like a year because I came into my inheritance in Liverpool, you know, when I was 21. My trust, my trust fund broke. I was like, <laughs> fuck school! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that was a wild year you know but i had to get myself back on track real quick yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah you know financially that can happen to anybody honestly you have been natural yeah you, you know i mean everybody you know at a young age when we look back sometimes you know we say i don't regret one second not a second not a second so liverpool finished here uh by the time i was done in liverpool it was time to uh, start making my record because there was I was 23 now, 22. You know there was nothing to wait for. I'd finished school, it was time, and this is where my dad really came in as an inspiration. Because when you say how much did my dad inspire me, you know I grew up inside the music, like every day in Kalakuta and in the Republic as well. One thing a lot of people did not know was that in the Republic, foreign music was banned. Non-African music was banned, but not like band band, like you can't play it, you just can't play it loud, you know? So we could listen to our hip-hop in our room, but we couldn't bang that shit. Pardon my French. We couldn't bump it, you know? We were Afrobeat all the time, growing up in the music, but I always listened to it as a fan. But as I grew up and trying to become a musician myself, I really started to understand the genius of my dad. And it was here in Liverpool. What LA was to my father, Liverpool was to me. You know, because it was the first time I was living without my family. It was the first time I was out of the house. You know, I was always in my cocoon in the Republic. You know, the Prince of Afrobeat. Everybody waiting on me, hand and foot. I was still telling my, <laughs> I was telling Fab today how I don't know how to do any chores. I can't iron. I can't cook. I can't make my bed. I can't do anything because I just grew up like you know Akim. You know, in coming to America. The only difference between me and Hakim was that we didn't have an elephant. <laughs> and we didn't, we didn't have violin uh, 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 players to wake me up in the morning. We didn't have violinists in the morning. <laughs> but, you know, I had, you know, girls taking my bath for me. You know, everything. I was raised like a little prince. I was banned, actually banned from doing chores. You know, if they caught me doing chores, I was a, it was a, you know, so this was my upbringing. So coming to Liverpool was the first time I had to do things myself, you know, make my own bed, shabbily. I didn't do it so good, but you know, I came into my own here and listened to my father, now as a musician, now trying to grow up, becoming my own man, having that uh, chance to be secluded from my, from my own original life. You know, I had to like see life understand life, really begin to understand what my dad was even talking about. Because now I was growing up. My dad died when I was 14, you know. So, yeah, that for me is the link between Liverpool, my dad inspiring me, and my music. It's kind of a long story, but, you know, there it is. A lot of people have been asking me questions. I said, I will let him tell you the meaning himself. Because I told them the meaning. They say, are you serious? They said, what is the meaning of Anikulapu? And Nikulakpo, you know, Akpo is a Yoruba word because hunters, back in the days, hunters, when they went to hunt, you know, we didn't hunt the way people hunt today. We, it was a spiritual, it was also a spiritual journey to be a hunter, you know, because as you take from nature, you have to give back. So all hunters had a little pouch, you know, that they put all the things they give back, the seeds they will plant when they kill an animal, they plant something or, you know, so they all had this. And also to protect them, from getting eaten by the lion, you know, because the hunter can also be the hunted. <laughs> so you had your, you had all your power. So this little thing is called Akpo. It was a pouch. So Anikulakpo means I have death in my pouch, not pocket in this pouch, you know, Kuti, so I can't die, you know. So it's like a, it's a hyphenated, you know, uh, uh, name. If you're very elitist. You know. <laughs> so, uh, uh what advice would you give to the younger generations of musicians coming up now in Africa and across Europe? I don't have advice for musicians in general. I don't even have advice for people. You know, for me, I think, you know, but I always say, 
if I have to say something, it's not about like advising young musicians. We have to, as you said, in, we have to be inclusive. There's a, also a concept in the African community, the global African community. You know, there's no such thing as the African diaspora. We are one global African community. We just need to re realize that, you know. And when we start to move that way, you know, we'll see changes. Anyway, you know, one thing that we always uh, 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 don't take into consideration as the global African community is that I really believe, oh, music must act. Music change the world. Music can change the world. Yes, music can inspire the change you know, that the world needs. But if African lawyers are not being lawyers because of justice, they want to just make money. If African doctors just want to make money and they're not being doctors because they want to heal African people, African psychiatrists, engineers, bankers, these are the real people that will change the world. You know, musicians can only inspire that change. Maybe that's where art also drops the ball. Because instead of trying to inspire the change, they just go with the flow. You know, but I feel like our message has to always be inclusive of all, all the talents that Africa has to offer. So we remind ourselves that we still have a duty because as African people, we must remember we are the only ones not invited to the table in this capitalism. If you think, you know, because we always believe I'm self-made. No African man in this world is self-made. If you say that, it's just because you are ignorant. Because to be a doctor, somebody had to die. To be a lawyer, somebody had to die. To go to school, somebody had to die. To be a teacher, somebody had to... We pay the blood price for every single thing we have achieved within this capitalist, imperialist system that governs the world today. And for some African people to get up the ladder that other people built with blood and sweat and tears and bones and knock it over and be like, I'm self-made, is ridiculous. So we must always understand that concept that we have a debt to pay forward. You know, for me, it's not about telling musicians, you know, we have to tell everybody that. We have a debt. We are children of sacrifice. And we must understand that we have a debt to pay forward, you know. And uh, finally, Sheung, what are you taking away from Africa with you today? Oh, man, lots of joy, you know, lots of joy. Um, because, first of all, it's good to be back. You know, being in Liverpool, playing here today. Coming back to this park where we played a lot of football with my friends. It's got a lot of goals here. <laughs> Don't play. <laughs> I can't show you my skills anymore. I busted my knee. You know. <laughs> you know, but it, it brought me a lot of joy today. Everybody in the band knew I was extra happy being in Liverpool today, you know, yeah. And that's why the ancestors welcomed me with so much rain. You know, my dad used to always say that our grandmother his mom, my grandmom, after she died, she took the position of Oya. And every time we do something joyous in our family, it rains. Uh, that's a fact. When we name any child, it rains. When we celebrate any birthday, it rains. Even if it is not rainy season, it must shower or rain or something. You know, even the day my dad was buried, it was at 3 p.m. And the sun, the moon, and the stars were out at 3 p.m., you know. So we have that connection. You know, so. According to African forefathers, they said it's a very good sign when the rain comes like that, yes. you know. Yes. And, uh, you know, I've been a fan of your dad since I was like that. From Kalakuta Republic down to the shrine, I was, I was, I was a diehard. I was a diehard uh, of fella, and I love the music. I love the activism. I love the human rights part of it. I love the way he puts the government on their toes all the time. And I'm so glad I could see the spirit in you as well, to be honest. And uh, I'm so proud of you, the way you follow your activism, you know, your human rights, the way your dad is doing it. It's just, all, it's just the same, you know. I draw, the, I draw all the energy from the people. You know, I, I don't take credit for that. You know, I don't think even, even if my dad is alive, he would take credit for it. Yeah, the people are the power because we stand on the shoulders of so many great people. You know, that's why as, an Af as African people, I wonder why we love Jesus so much. You know, you know, this guy died, knew he was going to wake up in three days. You know, if I know I'm going to wake up in three days, I'll die for all you motherfuckers. Oh, Pardon my French one more time. You know, I'll die for everybody. But we as African people, we had so many great people that have given up their lives for us to be where we are today without the promise of resurrection. 
You know, we are the truly chosen people in this world, in this modern era, because so many people have paid that price. So many great men who could have gone on to be billionaires and live the life, but they decided to dedicate their lives for us. We were that special, you know. And the job of this system is to make us forget that how special we are, so we can reduce ourselves to chasing the bag. You know, when we've always been greater than that, we own the bag. Everything everybody wants comes from Africa. I mean, we own the bag, you know, and we are now the people that chase the bag. I don't get it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, th thank you so much, Sheon. We really appreciate your contribution, and we're so happy you gave us the best of the music today. Very nice saxophone, as usual, and we're so proud of you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, man. <laughs>